Welcome to another episode of On the Ballot with Ballotpedia. I'm your host, Victoria Rose, and thanks for tuning in. Today, I'm joined by Joshua Spivak, who's the author of the Recall Elections blog, Senior Research Fellow at the California Constitution Center at Berkeley Law, and Senior Fellow at the Hugh L. Carey Institute for Government Reform at Wagner College. Spivak's considered one of the foremost authorities on recall elections. He covers domestic and international recall developments on his blog, and he also regularly writes op-eds on the subjects for outlets like The Hill, Barron's, and elsewhere. In his 2021 book, Recall Elections from Alexander Hamilton to Gavin Newsom, Spivak distills over 25 years of research and provides a crash course on recalls and their long history. Josh, thanks for coming on the podcast. You probably won't be surprised to hear that some of your most loyal followers work right here at Ballotpedia, so we're very excited to have you on. Oh, thanks for having me on. I've been a, a big fan of Ballotpedia for basically since the beginning. Uh, we've kind of worked in tandem in following recalls. Yes, for sure. So to start, why recalls? What in your professional or academic career sparked your interest in that specific form of direct democracy? Well, it was actually that there was very little on it. Um, I was getting a master's thesis um, a number of years ago in the 90s, and I came across a paper that said that there had not been a book on recalls in many years, and they just started to be a few recalls right then in California in 94 and 95, and the 95 ones were fascinating. Um, and so that felt like a good topic. So I wrote a a thesis on state legislative recalls in California, and then I kept it up. Turned out nobody else really followed it. So over time, uh, the expertise grew. But what also happened over time was the recall became more important. Uh, There had been one governor who faced a recall in U.S. history in the 20th century. Since then, there have been three Uh, There have been many, many more state legislative recalls occurring in recent years versus what was happening in the 20th century. So there's been this uh, growth of it, at least in the public knowledge, though it could be that we're having about the same number of local recalls as ever before. Yeah, for sure. We'll get into the rise in recalls a little bit later, but how about we step back a bit and define a recall? What exactly makes up a recall? Why they exist? So it, there's there's a lot of different possibilities with the recall definition. The best one, I feel, is where the voters petition to have a new election of some sort for an elected official. Uh, and that's where the recall is. And that whether that person stays in office or is removed from office. But the key is really that the voters petition versus the elected officials impeach. So it's more direct democracy. Uh, facet. And it grew out of the American progressivism era, but your book actually starts at Alexander Hamilton. So I was wondering what the connection there would be. So recalls go back way, all the way back. Some people trace it to Greece and Rome. Uh, In America, the first instance is in a a fashion in um, Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1631. But then it... uh, there exists this quasi recall. That's what they had, and the the the, um, the Articles of Confederation government and Pennsylvania had this, where an elected body could try to recall the official who's appointed to another elected body, and it was seen as a recall. But in the in the constitutional debate, there was discussion of a recall of what would be the House members along the lines of what we would think of. They voted it down, but. Afterwards, there was a huge debate, and including Alexander Hamilton, who spent days in the New York Ratification Convention talking about this, whether the senators should face a recall, though the senators at that point were elected by the state legislators themselves. So it would have been a slightly different version. It did not pass. It was not adopted. There were thoughts that there should be another way called instruction where a senator could be removed, sort of. Um, not going to get into that in too much depth, but then the recall dies, and it's not discussed until the later the later part of the twenty of the nineteenth century. But it existed elsewhere. It existed in Switzerland and other countries. And then what happened uh, was a, a man named John Randolph Haynes really brought it forward first in LA in 1903, and then other state other places adopted in 1908. Uh, Oregon became the first state to adopt it. And in 1911, California adopted it. Uh, What's interesting also, just the the recall is sort of a 
Bermuda Triangle. Uh, things just disappear and nobody knows what happened. So we recently found a paper uh, that suggested that San Diego had the recall in 1889 and nobody mentioned that. No, no contemporary source mentioned that. And I don't know. I don't know why. Yeah, very interesting. Recall is very a lot state by state and by localities. So could you describe to our listeners some of the key differences in how recalls work across states? So the two big buckets are that whether the recall should be what's called the political recall, where you're voted out for any reason whatsoever. And when you think of recalls, California, Wisconsin, Michigan, that's those type of recalls where you just, I don't like the guy, or I don't like his politics, or I don't like his policy. Um, The other bucket is what I call a malfeasance standard, or it could be it's previously called the judicial recall standard, though that's kind of confusing because you think it's a judge being recalled. There, you need to show a statutorily delineated reason for the recall, Uh, malfeasance, uh, corruption, incompetence, those type of actions. So those are very rare uh, to actually happen. And a judge or some other elected body has to sign off on the recall to let it go forward. Those states, in those states, uh, among the state level recalls, and there's only been 48, only one of those states has had one. And even in that instance, uh, that was because the Supreme Court of Washington State in 1981 uh, seemed to allow a political recall law and then since changed the law back. So even beyond that, then there's a lot of variation in recall, in types of recalls. Uh, And in fact, a book written in 1930 notes that there seemed to be, at that time, just all types of, you know, it seemed every type of recall was tried. So some are uh, what we call an automatic replacement model, where it's a yes or no vote on the elected official, and then whoever you fill it by law. So they may be appointed by the other members of city council, or maybe the lieutenant governor becomes the governor, say. Uh, The other method, the California method, is where there's a, a yes or no vote and the replacement is voted on by the people either that day or another day. And in some instances, the replacement can run against, uh, could run to replace themselves, the official who faced the recall. And in some cases, they've actually won, which we saw in Massachusetts a few years ago in a very noteworthy recall in Fall River. Uh, The other model, the other popular model is in Wisconsin, where there's a new election. And it's just, okay, here's the recall and here's a new election. There could be a primary. There could be a lot of different methods. In England... They where they have a recall for you have to have corruption uh, of some sort. You have to actually be convicted of a crime, but not be convicted for a year sent more than a year sentence. You get the signatures, and the the uh, position is seen as completely open. It's just you're out, and then you could run in the re- replacement race. But at that moment, there's nobody in the in the seat. Going back to California, your home state, there have been a lot of noteworthy recalls in California, most recently in San Francisco, and then obviously Gavin Newsom's recall that he survived in 2021. Is there a recall in California's history that you have found most fascinating? Uh, You know, the 1995 ones that I really got into, those were great. Um, What happened was, uh, and and it is somewhat of a complicated story, and it's actually a big one in terms of what happened with California and what happened with American politics afterwards, uh, the California Assembly in 94 was this big election. Republicans did fantastic. They win control of the Assembly 41 to 39. And for the first time in 25 years, they're looking to kick out the famous speaker, Willie Brown, who is maybe the most famous legislative state legislator in U.S. history, uh, you know, thinking about it. And the day comes and Willie Brown managed to get somebody to switch. So then they they launch a recall against the person who switched, Paul Horcher. They launch a recall against another Democrat who they thought was more vulnerable. Eventually, they kick that guy out, uh, Paul Horcher. The Democrat survives. Um, and then Willie Brown gets somebody else to switch. And then they have to recall her, Doris Allen, who became speaker in that brief time. So those were just like what was happening there was really fascinating. And I guess those three are really, you know, they got to be among the top recalls. Yeah, Yeah, it's very interesting. It's not political history I've ever heard before. So very interesting. 
Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your recall elections blog? How do you go about choosing what to write about and the different trends to cover? Oh, so generally, uh, you know, it was not clear how I would start it at what I would do at the beginning. I thought I'd write more trend stuff and I do have that, but I try to cover any recall that I see coming across. Um, and so I have Google news alerts and things like that. And I look at Ballotpedia and, you know, just sort of the development, the threat, to the next stage, to the signatures, to the petitions, to the signatures, to the actual election. And then over time, I'll write different trend pieces. And, uh, you know, one of the big ones I did was for the L.A. district attorney. This was a recent one. Uh, The L.A. district attorney, there was a big signature gathering effort and it just failed. And so I looked at the signature rejection rate, how that works throughout the state, how that's worked for other recalls, how that's worked for initiatives as well. Uh, And it's pretty interesting just how signatures are rejected in some places and not in others, how that fails. Uh, It's, it's, you know, a fundamental part of democracy, but one that we generally overlook and don't care about. Yeah. It's something I cover in my own work, covering ballot measures, watching signature campaigns go through and have their signatures. Even when they exceed the threshold of the number submitted by a huge number, they could still fail depending on that signature validity rate. Your recent reporting seems to have focused on a few major themes. We're seeing a lot of laws being put forward to expand recall or put it in state constitutions. I think recently there was one in Arkansas. Have these laws been proposed or adopted more frequently in certain states or areas of the country? Well, right now we haven't had a a state level recall adopted since 96 in Minnesota. Generally, you know, as a general rule, the recall started in the West and the Midwest. And if you look at where they are, that's where they're predominantly focused. And the eastern states don't have them. So not that they don't have them, but they're more limited and fewer states have them. If you look at this, I guess, nine states, it's not clear, uh, nine or 10 states that don't have recall laws. And most of them are focused are outside of Utah. They're all in the east. Uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, uh, South Carolina. These states have no recalls. So they're all, they're really Indiana. They're uh, in the East. Um, and I, I think there's a theory, you know, my theory behind this is that the Eastern states had a well established political system when the Progressive Era started, and they had different groups fighting each other. So, you know, whether it was the farmers versus the bankers versus the traders in New York. Um, versus the railroad. But in California and in the Western states, they didn't have that system uh, in place. So one political, one not one economic entity could take supreme power in the state, which is what happened in California. The railroad was this huge, the, the Southern Pacific Railroad, it was called the Octopus, or the SP was the nickname. And it had this overwhelming power. And so when they adopted the recall, they used that phrase. The, 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 the campaign was kick the Southern Pacific out of, out of politics. This was just, you know, I think throughout the West, that's where you would see one part, one power. And so you needed to come to a new weapon. And that was the recall. And that was direct democracy, the initiative and referendum as well. So the Eastern states less likely to use it. And I think you see this the same with ballot measures, that initiatives, New York doesn't have the initiative process. Other states do not have the initiative process. Good points. As we kind of touched on earlier, there's been a rise in recalls at the, especially at the local level with school boards and city councils. Um, in our most recent edition here at Ballotpedia of our recall report, we tracked 256 recall efforts against 432 officials in 2022, which was the second highest behind 2021. Where do you see this wave of local recalls coming from? Well, the recent wave, especially for school boards, was was very interesting. It was the first time we'd seen this in 2021, 2020, 21, and 22. What happened was COVID. Uh, Generally, recalls are not partisan. They're not political in in the way we think of because local offices are not partisan and political, not just that they're not elected that way, but the, the cities... The counties, the towns, they are one party dominated. Most states are one party dominated. Most cities, most towns are one party dominated. So 
partisanship does not have the same effect on recalls in general. Um, but what happened with COVID, was, and so one issue does not predominate across the country. It's usually these very basic local issues like firing of a city manager or combining school districts. But COVID had this major change in people's lives in a way that had never happened before, where we shut down the schools, where there were masking mandates. And so people wanted to express their anger and wanted to change policy. What did they do? They went to recalls. Uh, and it was actually a good, an interesting use of the recall because there were so many attempts there and almost all of them failed. And they did not, you know, they did not get the signatures or when they got on the ballot, they lost. The people who had pushed through the masking mandates and the, the different rules survived the vote. And these were not in uh, liberal jurisdictions for the most part. You're talking Idaho. You're talking places like that. The other, another issue that we've seen recently that's kind of interesting is uh, wind farms and solar power. Those those issues have become, especially in the Midwest, Michigan has been a big fan of using it. Um, there, there's a lot of local anger to adopting a wind farm apparently, and. Again, this is not necessarily partisan. They're kicking out Republicans who have said, you could put a wind farm on your farm. Uh, you could put uh, you know, uh, whatever, whatever material and people don't like it. They don't want to see it. And so they kick them out of office. You recently wrote that we're starting to see this rise in recalls decline. Do you think that recalls will still remain somewhat of a popular tool for citizens or will it kind of go back to where it was prior to the coronavirus? I think it always has this ebb and flow. I don't think it will be used in the same fashion, but there are a couple factors that I think really make the recall more likely to be used. One is just people knowing about it. Uh, you know, Gray Davis, Gavin Newsom, and all those other, all these school boards, people see a recall succeed, then, hey, maybe I could do this. Why, why not me? Um, the other you know, and then there, there's actually, it was on The Simpsons. It was on Parks and Rec, though, interestingly enough, Parks and Rec is set in the Indiana, a state that does not have the recall at all. So if they would have said it anywhere else, it would have been fine, but not Indiana. But I think the big thing is the technological advancement. I think it's made recalls much easier to get on the ballot. I think it's made ballot measures as well, but recalls especially. Uh, so previously, you had to get people upset. You had to get people notified. You had to get people interested. You had to run a campaign. Now, social media allows you to spread the story around. Your emails let you organize spreadsheets that altered that original killer app. You could get people together and figure out how, how many signatures we need and basically keep everything organized, cell phones. Uh, running a campaign is much cheaper. At some points, it's much more expensive, but at other points, you know, you have a laser printer. How hard is that? You're sending emails. Those don't cost anything. These The cost of running a campaign in the past was much higher for these small races uh, than it is now. Though, if you run want to put in uh, ads on TV, yes, that's going to be a big problem. Uh, there's a, a mover's advantage where recalls seem to succeed more often than they fail. So why not try it? And then there's raising funds. Uh, and I, I always think of this with uh, Joe Wilson, the congressman who yelled, you lie at uh, President Obama during the um, State of the Union uh, over a decade ago. And afterwards, the, within the week, his opponent raised like 1.3 million and he raised 1.1 million without any effort. There was nothing that they did. They just, people gave the money. And since then we've seen this, people give money and they could raise money in a simple fashion in a way that you couldn't do before. So the recall has that. Uh, that's another advantage. Are there any trends you're watching in the recall world heading into this year? Any laws you're watching? I mean, there's, you know, as I said, the, the solar power powered ones uh, the, or the wind farm ones are, are pretty interesting. Um, I do know that there's anything in particular. There's already been seven recalls this year. Six people have been removed. One has survived. Uh, that one in Alaska. Um, but I don't know that there's any. There, there's been attempts to cut back on recalls. So far, those have not succeeded anywhere. Uh, there are two very notable recalls that may be happening. 
won in LA against the city councilman, Kevin DeLeon, and he was the former state Senate president. He got caught up in a gerrymandering scandal where racial epithets were uttered. Uh, there's been calls for him to resign. If that gets to the ballot, that will be very interesting. Uh, the other one in New Orleans, that's that one. Petitioners are claiming they have their 1,000 signatures away from getting it. I don't know if they're including how many signatures they need as a buffer, which would be make it a lot more higher that they would need, but uh, that would be kind of a fascinating one. Um, VA recalls, whether they continue to happen. Uh, they So last year we had, so we hadn't had a DA recall in quite a while. DAs are never a pop, have never been a popular target of recalls, uh, neither of judges, even though I should say judges were the most comp, uh, controversial part of the recall, whether to include judges. In California, it was a heavy debate on that, and it was only due to a very ill-timed and poor Supreme Court decision in the state that led to them just being able to push it through. Uh, but judges have rarely been fa- faced a recall. In 2018, there was, for the first time in over 30 years, a recall of a judge, uh, and he was removed in the state in Santa Clara. Uh, DAs rarely faced a recall, but now we're seeing more attempts against DAs. And as the progressive prosecutor movement grows, we may be seeing more DA recalls happening. My final question for you is a question I asked prior guests on the podcast, Richard Winger. He studies ballot access and third parties in our system. Oh, yeah. He's the best. (laughs) Yeah. 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 The question is, what's your argument for why everyday Americans should be aware of recalls and recall laws in their states? You know, it's it's an interesting question. For the most part, people aren't that aware um, I think it's it's an important part of democracy. It's not a big part. It's in many ways, you know, compared to the initiative, compared to ballot measures, it is insignificant or fairly insignificant. Those are much more powerful, but they're still this weapon that people like to use. Um, and they really show, and one of the reasons I'm interested in it, uh, at, at this point in time, we're sort of in a in a state where national politics is both terrifying and boring. Um, it's, there's none of the color is there. None of the, the different personalities aren't really there in the same way. And recalls in local elections show that, show what, what people happen, what happens when you're not focused on partisan issues, when you're focused on what are we doing about governance? What are we doing? What are our issues locally? And I think recalls show that happening and people getting involved and getting active, uh, for good or ill, and frequently, I'm sure, I'm sure the official who loses will always say ill. But yeah, I, you know, looking at them, a lot of them are not great, I, not great reasons. But they really do help change the political process because of that. For sure, and I think we've definitely seen that rise in local politics over the past few years for the reasons that you stated, coronavirus and all of that. So definitely be an interesting subject to watch over the next few years. I want to thank you again for coming on today and sharing your expertise. And hopefully we can keep our partnership with Ballotpedia and the recall elections block going. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.